Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the last time we looked at the book of Judges, and during that time we were looking at um, kind of the, the state of Israel during that time where everyone was doing what they basically wanted. And we were looking at an overall picture of Israel during that time over a large span of time, looking at several different generations and how they lived and how they kept getting stuck in this cycle. And that cycle was, things would be good for a while, and so they start turning to idolatry, and they start sinning. And then God would hand them over to some enemy that would ultimately come and destroy them or take them captive, or they'd be in a war with. And then after a period of suffering and struggling, um, then, at that time, they would cry out to God. They would repent. And God would finally, at that time, send a Redeemer. It was in the form of a judge that would rescue them um, from, from that, that difficult situation. And he would then kind of rule over them during that time. And as we looked at judges, we looked at, it was always looking at the main figures during that time. Um, the leaders, the judges, and the nation of Israel as a whole. Um, but in all honesty, looking at the history and this grand scale, especially looking at the Bible and these things, sometimes it can seem a bit cold. Um, these kind of events and these kind of situations can seem kind of um, distant and kind of hard for us to relate to. I mean, you know, how many of us are like Abraham, you know, or one of the patriarchs like Isaac or Jacob, or even like Joseph? How many of us have gone through slavery where we come out or, or you know, gone into imprisonment and come out and then we become governors, like these very elite people? Or someone maybe like, you know, Moses, you know, who was the leader of the people who rescued them from the nation of Egypt, better than the Pharaoh, in a way. Now, how many of us are like that? Um, or even in the book of Judges, looking at Samson and Gideon, these great leaders of the nations. And I think that's the significance of the book of Ruth. It's a very short book. It's only four chapters. But in the book of Ruth, we look at a very ordinary family. It's an ordinary family that lived during that time and it gives us kind of a glimpse into the private life of not a leader, not a famous person, but just, just a normal family. And so Ruth, this book kind of makes things more intimate for us. You know, it's very easy to talk about all of these general problems that we face. You know, a nation going to war, a nation suffering. Um, but the book of Ruth, it really puts a, a face um, to these things. And it helps us really to relate and connect to what's going on. And so this story, Ruth, it's a story of a remnant. It's not an elite that changed the world, but a simple remnant that had true faith and piety during this very dark age, you know, set in the time of judges, when everyone was doing whatever they wanted. And so we see in this book the importance of faithful love, especially in human relations, a selfless devotion, and really showing love and care for others. The theme of this story is redemption. But the main character, it's actually not Ruth, even though that's the title of the book. The main character of this story is actually Naomi. Um, her life was a life of despair, of hopelessness, and her life turns into a life of joy. And it's after this turning point. And for us too, we have the same turning point in our lives. We have a turning point when we meet with Christ, our lives change. And for Naomi, it was a time where she went through a life of being totally empty to becoming full. A life that was destitute, turning into one of hope and security. So today, as we go through this book together, um, we're going to look at the life of Naomi. Before the turning point of meeting with the dreamer, and then after. And this is where we're actually going to find Christ in our story. Um, so let's go through this together. And we're going to look at, it's basically, each point is almost by chapter. So point number one we're going to look at is, you know, before meeting the Redeemer. This is an empty period for, for Naomi. For Naomi, um, she's with her family. This family is, is coming and they're traveling to Moab. Um, she has her husband, Elimelech, who is the father, um, Naomi, the mother. And she's going with her two sons, Malone and Kilion. So they're traveling together, 
And when they reach Moab, um, the sons, they get married. They get married to these two women, Orpha and Ruth. And for that time when they're in Moab, you know, things seem good. Things seem to be going well. But everything makes a turn for the worse. Ultimately, they face two waves of tragedy that come. The first wave of tragedy is for Naomi. Her husband dies. And if that's not bad enough, enough, there's a second wave of tragedy that comes for her. Where not one, but both of her sons die. Um, you know, you can almost imagine the state that Naomi is in at this time. You know, she had come to this, this other place with her whole family and things were going well. And then one by one they all died, the people around her. So her husband and her sons, you know, they died. Now, this is a very difficult state to be in. I mean, if you've met someone that's lost a child, even losing one child, it's really hard for people to recover from that. But losing her husband, and then one child, and then her other child. You know, she's in a very um, difficult state. You know, she must have felt really cursed by God in this state. You can almost imagine the anger, the resentment, the bitterness, you know, even towards God during this time. The confusion of why this would happen. And we see this as kind of Naomi's emptying period. Because she's emptied of her hope. She's emptied of her joy. And in a way, she's emptied of her strength. And of her life, in a way. Um, she's ultimately destitute and in a state of despair. And so she goes and, and she goes to her daughters and she tells them basically to leave. She says, go back home. May the Lord show you kindness. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. <coughs> now, staying with Naomi for these two women, it would be wasteful in a way. Because she is not their blood relative. And now that their husbands are dead, um, they really have no reason to stay with her. Now, that is why for their sake, for their future, it is best that Naomi sends them away so they can find rest and peace with another family. What we see, we see in verse 10, they plead with her, saying, they will not go back, they will go with her. And in verse 11, Naomi says, return, return home. Why would you come with me? Return home, I am too old to have another husband. The reason she says this is because the custom of the law says that if their husband dies, the next of kin, a brother, would marry the girl. However, Naomi is making this very clear. This isn't possible. You know, it's not even in the realm of hope. You know, even if by God's grace, she says, if God, by God's grace she gets married that night and she has a child right away, you know, it would be so long for that child to grow up to be a husband for either one of them. She's making it very clear. You know, this is a bleak future if you're going to stay with me. And in verse 12, she's in, she even goes farther to say, It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. She feels cursed by God, and them staying with her would mean that they would be a part of that curse as well. You know, she does this very, very carefully, and she does this to make it very clear that this is going to be a choice that you have to make on your own. Um, she isn't saying, she's saying, don't stay with me if you feel obligated. Don't have pity for me and stay with me for that sake. You know, leave and be free to have a future. She's making the choice very, very clear to them. No persuasion at all. Um, she's ultimately putting the cost of staying with her in their hands. And I think that in the same way, Christ gives us that same choice. You know, Jesus said, he never said that, you know, it would be an easy life following after him. And he, he said that we'd have rest for our souls, of course. But physically, things would be rough. You know, you're going to face hardship, you're going to face difficulty. He says, but take hope, I have overcome the world. Jesus says, if you desire to follow me, you must take up your cross. Become an enemy of the world, in a way. And that is why the prosperity gospel that's preached in a lot of churches is so wrong. You know, God never says, if you follow Christ, you're going to have nice cars. 
You're going to receive lots of financial blessings. Things are going to be perfect. And it says that nowhere in the Bible. If you accepted Christ because you thought by doing so, you'd have riches, you'd have fame, you'd have fortune, recognition, or success. You accepted something that wasn't Christ. You accepted sin and the spirit of Satan because he's the one that makes these promises. And when Jesus was being tempted by the devil in the desert in Matthew 4, you know, he said that if you bow down to me, if Jesus bowed down to Satan, he would give him all the kingdoms. You know, this is the riches, the fortune, the recognition that the devil promises. You know, even in Genesis 3, 6, and 11, these poems, you know, us wanting to be like God, us chasing after the materialistic things, the physical desires that we want, worldly success and recognition, you know, these are the things that Satan is ultimately trying to deceive us through. God doesn't promise us those things, but he does promise us something else. He promises something that is of much greater value. Salvation. Eternal life. An abundant life. Freedom from sin, Satan, and hell. A life filled with hope. A life filled with purpose. Adopting us into his own family as his children. You know, this is the blessing that we have in Christ. So getting back to the story, after Naomi, she makes this very clear, the choice that they have to make. And after this time, the one daughter-in-law, Orpah, kisses her mother-in-law and says goodbye and leaves. Returning to her people and also returning to her God. Because the God of the Moabites, it's a different God. However, Ruth is different. Ruth clings tightly to Naomi and makes the great confession of faith. And that's found in Ruth 1, verses 16 to 18. It says, Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave your people, to leave you and turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. It says, when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. You know, Ruth here is ultimately choosing the God of the Israelites, choosing the true God to be her God. It's a confession of faith that she makes here. And so the two of them, they go, and they return to Bethlehem together. However, upon returning to Bethlehem, they face ridicule from the people. They face ridicule because, firstly, of her destitute state. You know, Naomi, when she left, things were going well. But when she returns, she has nothing. She lost everything. And in this state, she's, she's in a state, it's almost like she's cursed from God. And if people see that around her in the town, they see, oh, you know, they ask, what happened to her? You know, why is she like this? It must have been that she was cursed by God. She must have done something really bad to deserve this. So they spread rumors, and you could see them ridiculing her. And it's also because she returns with Ruth. Ruth is from, you know, Moab. She's a Moabitess. And she's a despised people of the Israelites. And so the whole town, they say, can this be Naomi? And so this is Naomi's response in 1 verses 20 to 21. She says, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. You know, Naomi's name, it originally means pleasant. But now she's saying, call me Mara, which means bitter. This is how her life has become. A life of bitterness, it's empty, afflicted, full of misfortune. And this is how the first part of the story ends, where she's in this empty state. And then we come to part two of the story in chapter two, and this is where the turning point of her life changes, or her life comes. And the vessel, or the way by which her life comes to change, is through Ruth. 
And that is why it is the title of the book as well. See, not only is she has a relative, it's from her husband's clan. And this man is a man of good standing. His name is Boaz. And his name ultimately means, in him is strength. And it says that Ruth, when they return back to this place, you know, Ruth, she goes and she gathers grain in the field. And this is the leftover grain. And of course, according to the law in Israel, um, they intentionally leave over some grain. You know, that's part of the law. It's the provision that God made for people like orphans, widows, the poor, the foreigners. So they can gather this, and so they can survive. It's in a way welfare. And so she goes and she gathers this grain from the fields. But then in Ruth 2.3, 2, it says something very important. And it's kind of something you might pass through very easily. Um, but in Ruth 2.3, it says, as it turns out, it is Boaz's field. Um, as it turns out. So you could say, is she just really lucky that this is the person that Naomi was thinking about? Um, or is this God's plan? You know, these words, as it turned out. Now here, secular people would say, you know, this is just chance, this is just random, there's no significance here. But we can see something else. As it turned out, this is God's divine providence. He has a plan here. And having a set of spiritual eyes allows us to see this. It's, it allows us to see that things don't happen by chance. Things don't happen because of luck. You know, this is by God's hand. This circumstances is designed by God to arrive the way they do here. And this is something important for us to remember. Now, even this week, I was faced with kind of a similar situation where you know, I was on my way to the immigration office to get um, something happened with my visa and I had to change something. Um, but on my way there, you know, I was, I was getting close to there and this foreigner just came up to me. Um, and he's like, are you headed to the immigration office? And I said, yeah. And so he kind of went with me and he was asking me these questions and we started talking. Uh, his name's Patrick, he's from Canada. And, you know, um, and so we were talking for a while and then we were getting closer to the immigration office and finally we got there. And when we got in, ultimately I had to go my way and he had to go his way. Because I had to take care of, you know, so my paperwork and he had his own thing. And so as I was writing out the, the paperwork and stuff, he came up to me and said, oh, I'm finished, so I'm gonna go. And so he shook hands and he left. And I was like, oh. I didn't even get his phone number. I didn't get any contact information. I was like, oh, there had to be a reason that God allowed us to meet like this. It's not often that, that just people come up and talk to me and, and we talk for like 10, 15, 20 minutes just randomly with the stranger. I was like, oh, I totally let this slip through my hands, this opportunity. And I was like, oh, man. you know, if God, if, if in some way he allows us to meet again, I got to get his contact information at least, at the very least, maybe a phone number or something. Um, so anyways, you know, I, I finish up at the immigration office. It takes a while, like 20, 30 minutes. And I'm walking back. You know, I don't see him or anything. And I'm pretty much at the subway. And I'm like, oh man, I should get some coffee. So I see this coffee shop coming up, and I go, and as I'm walking to the coffee shop, I see an individual sitting outside drinking coffee. And this is the same man that I met earlier. It's Patrick. And I'm like, man, this has gotta be, <laughs> this has gotta be the hand of God here. This isn't luck, this isn't chance. As it turned out, <laughs> he was there. You know, in that in that situation, and so I ended up, you know, getting coffee and talking to him for a while, and got his contact information, and we're actually going to meet again. We actually met once, but we're going to continue to meet. And it turns out he's a complete non-believer, um, and he has no background, no religious background at all. And so I see, you know, this is, you know, maybe God's plan for us to meet. But in these kind of things, you know, you know, people will always see this. You know, this is luck. This is nothing. Or you know, that's just a meeting. It, there's no purpose in it. But then for us, if we really have God's desire in our heart, a world evangelization, and we really have the joy of Christ, we know we want to share with people. And we know that God has people prepared. And God is going to attach those people to us. And so we see our meetings in a different way. You know, God organizes these situations. So we see these things with a set of spiritual eyes. Getting back to the story, if we look at Boaz, um, 
you know, she, she gathers the grain in Boaz's field. And Boaz, this is a very faithful and godly man. And when he greets his workers, he greets them with, The Lord be with you. And they reply, The Lord bless you. You know, in a way, this reminds me of, you know, when I go visit my grandparents in the Catholic Church when they end it. It's like, The Lord be with you. And you reply, And also with you. Um, it's this blessing of being with God. Emmanuel. And Boaz, he shows compassion to Ruth. You know, and here we come to the turning point, um, the turning point in this story. And this is also where we come to find Christ. Um, starting from Ruth 2, verses 8 and 9. First he addresses her, he says, My daughter. Now this shows the closeness, the intimacy. He says, Don't go to other fields, but stay with my other servant girls here. So even though she's this foreigner, this outcast normally, he is accepting her. He says, I told my men not to touch you. You will be safe. You know, she's a woman, you know, gathering up this grain on her own. She's very vulnerable in this state. But he's basically saying, I will protect you. And then he says, when you are thirsty, drink from my water jars. He's providing for her as well. So here, if you look closely, here you can see the love of Christ. You know, the love of Christ for us, offering acceptance of us as sinners. We are outcasts. We are foreigners. And yet Christ accepts us even though we are in a state of sin. He offers us protection, provides us in our needs. And this is God's compassion that he also shows for us. And boys, he sees Ruth's devotion to Naomi. And in a way, you know, God also sees our devotion and our faith in Christ. And so in verse 12, Boaz says, May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May the Lord richly reward you, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So there, there's an amazing imagery here. He uses, he says, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And because you can almost imagine this is the protection of God, the care he has for his family. You know, a lot of times, if you look at, you know, baby ducks or chicks, they're traveling around with their mother. You see that whenever there's a danger, whenever there's something that can endanger them in any way, they all run to their mother. And she opens up her wings, and they all run underneath. And she covers them. She protects them. And when there's a storm or when it's cold, they also run under her wings, and she protects them and covers them. This is the same comfort that we have from God. And so Ruth confesses that she has found comfort, favor, and kindness from Boaz. He provides even extra food for her as well. And she takes all of this and she brings it to her mother-in-law. And we see here Naomi's confession after this response, after this turning point that has come to her life also through Ruth. In verse 20, this is the verse we read today, The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. And she added, That man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. So what is a kinsman redeemer? Um, like I said at the start, the key theme of the book of Ruth is redemption. And here is where we find it. Because the role of the kinsman redeemer is someone that protects the interests of the family. So at times, they will provide an heir for a brother that died. At times, they will redeem land that a poor relative had to sell outside of the family. At times, they will redeem even a relative that had been sold into slavery. This is the turning point of the story. The meeting with Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. From Naomi's words, we see that her despair has now turned to hope. She's starting to take courage. And so for us also, this is the turning point for us, when we meet with Christ. So if you look at this story again, it's someone that has lost everything, that was cursed, emptied of hope, facing ridicule from others because of their state. Hopeless and empty are the words that characterize her life. And until this day, the day of meeting the kinsman redeemer. This is the day that everything changed. 
She got a glimpse of hope and she grabs onto it. This is the turning point of the story. In our past, it might have been full of tragedy, despair, hardship, you know, suffering under Satan, under sin, living a worthless life, a pointless life. You know, and some of us, we might have gotten to the state where we were brought to a point of complete hopelessness. For a lot of people, they need to be brought down to that level. But having a feeling that, that a feeling of emptiness as well, knowing that really something is missing in our lives, that all the things that we try to do to fill it aren't satisfying. But the day we meet with Christ, all is made new. This is the greatest day of our life, the day when we have the turning point in our life, where we meet Christ, our Redeemer. And just like Naomi, we gain hope, we gain life, we gain courage to continue on. And God has not stopped showing His kindness to us through Christ, the Kinsman Redeemer. We are redeemed. Our debt of sin is paid. And we too are redeemed from slavery to Satan, purchased by the blood of Christ. We are provided with a new family as children of God. And we are blessed to have God's protection. So now we meet on and we continue on in this story after meeting this Redeemer. And in chapters 3 and 4, we're going to look at the next few chapters. There can be some confusion of what happens here. We see that Naomi, she gives Ruth some advice. She gives Naomi, I mean Ruth, advice on how to become the wife of Boaz. In chapter 3, verses 1 to 18. Now at first, the advice I thought that Naomi was giving to Ruth, um, if you read the advice that she gives, it kind of seems kind of shady, in a way, kind of immoral, um, at least in my mind. It's almost like she's trying to seduce him and sleep with him. You know, Naomi tells Ruth, you know, after her boys has been drinking, to find out where he sleeps, um, get into bed with him, and when he wakes up, you know, ask to get under the covers with him. You know, in this way, you know, is, is this like the way that we marry a godly man? <laughs> you know, seduce him and, and kind of get him to make a mistake forcing him into marriage? You know, is this the right advice that she's giving um, to Ruth? You know, that's totally a misunderstanding. You've really got to understand the culture to understand what's going on here. Um, you know, first, you know, regarding the location um, where he's sleeping, he's sleeping on the threshing floor. And this is actually normal for the landowners to do. But not just the landowner. He is not sleeping alone here. He's sleeping with the other men that work with him. They spend the night there on or near the threshing floor, um, ultimately to protect it, to protect it um, from the grain that is left there. So he's not alone. And also the time period that this is happening, uh, it's during the harvest time. The harvest is a, it's a festive time where there is a lot of eating and drinking and merriment, and celebrating. Um, and so she's not like trying to get him drunk on purpose, you know, um, to carry out her plan. It's nothing like that. And then if you look at Naomi's instructions that he gives to her, um, in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 4, um, she tells her to uncover his feet and lie down. This is actually a formal request of marriage. It's actually a similar custom is still practiced even today. Um, in some parts of the Middle East. It's a request for marriage. And when she's saying, you know, spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are the kinsman redeemer, this too is a request for marriage. Um, she's actually calling him out on the promise that he made her earlier. When he said in, in chapter 2, 12, May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May the Lord richly reward you under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So spreading the garment over her was her appealing to what he said. Under his protection, under his household, that she will be cared for, that she will have refuge. And so how does this godly man respond? He says, bless you. You are kind. You are not running after young men, the rich or the poor, not seeking after the physical things. He says, don't be afraid. Let it be known that you are a woman of noble character. Now what she did is very admirable and moral. It's not promiscuous or shady in any way. However, he points out the fact that um, according to the law, 
if there's a closer relative, that person should be given priority in the marriage. And so he has her wake up before anyone sees her, and he gives her something, six measures of barley, because he doesn't want her to go away from her mother empty-handed. And this is a part of kind of the contract that things went well with the meeting. But we see later that in chapter 4, that the other person that was supposed to marry her, that could have married her, is unable to. So we come to the end of this story. Boaz announces to all the elders and all the people, he does a lot of these things all in the open. He's not secretive or anything. He says, today you are my witnesses. I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech. I have also acquired Ruth as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name may not disappear from among his family. So this is to carry on the family line that Naomi was attached to. And he is saying, I'm willing to you know, continue that, that name so it doesn't end. And so the elders, they bless them. They say, may she be like Rachel and Leah, who built up the house of Israel. May you be famous in Bethlehem. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And later, they have a child. So in the end of this story, um, we look back, and it turns back to the main character, which is Naomi. And it says, Naomi took the child and cared for him. And they said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So in the end, Naomi's emptiness it has now turned to fullness. Naomi has achieved an error in the place of her dead son. She has a family. And so her despair that was once there has now turned to joy. So in conclusion, you know, there's a lot of times where you know, we kind of need to stop and I think reflect on our life a little bit. Um, we might not be the most elite people. Uh, we may not be a leader um, or something that everyone wants to be. Um, we might not be a famous person or be the one standing on stage or be the one with all the wealth and the financial blessings. But for us, the story of this remnant, it should bring us comfort and peace. And especially looking at our lives before Christ and after Christ. You know, before Christ, if you really reflect on that state, it was a state of tragedy, despair, hopelessness, worthless, without purpose. We had the burden of sin, of guilt and shame, suffering. And, you know, people, if you look at the world, people are struggling to survive in this state. You know, and a lot of times they turn to drugs, they turn to alcohol. A lot of people even turn to suicide to escape this kind of situation. But then we have our meeting with our kinsman redeemer, which is Christ, the Son of the living God. This is where all things are made new, where even our tears are wiped away, where we gain hope, eternal life, and purpose for our lives. Now these women, they're women of true faith. Even though they might have been bitter or angry towards God, they never gave up their faith. And through their devotion to God, and through the piety and love that they had, we see that God blessed them. They were blessed, especially in their meeting of the kinsman redeemer, as we are blessed in our meeting with Christ. And although their life may seem insignificant, look at the baton of faith that was passed on. Who would have thought that through them, through this family, the greatest king of all of Israel would be born? You know, the faith that was passed on from them to their child to the child after them, this is why David is known as the king that had a heart after God. So I pray that you too, even if you may think that you might have an insignificant life, I pray that you can realize that God can make even that and it's something that is great for his kingdom. Because we never know the significance or the impact of our life, our faith, and our actions in this world. But God does. Let's pray as we hold on to today's message.